It's your first day at this school, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, where did you grow up? In this neighbourhood. I was born at the city hospital. Really? Me too. My family has always lived here, but we haven't got any relatives here. My mum came here because of my dad. They met in Germany, but when they got married, they decided to move here to start a family. Right. So, have you got any brothers or sisters? No, I'm an only child. What about you? I've got a twin sister and an older brother, but he's in his early twenties and at university. We never see him. University? I'd love to go. Me too. Anyway, at lunchtime, I'll introduce you to my friends if you like. That would be great. Thanks. Hi, Andy. Has your sister left yet? Yes, she went this morning. Wow. I think if I went abroad to study, I'd be really nervous. She was, but she was also looking forward to being independent. So am I, but if I leave home, I'll stay in the same city. I don't want to travel far. Really? But if you live abroad, you learn a lot from the experience. Yeah, I know, but I'm not sure I would want to go for very long. If I went, I'd probably go for a month at the most. Well, if we go to university, we'll have the option to study abroad for a year, like my sister. Wouldn't you like to do that if you had the chance? Maybe. I just think I'd be so nervous if I was in a place where I didn't know anybody. Yeah, but if you go to university abroad, you meet lots of other students who are in the same situation as you. It's a great way to meet new people, and you can enjoy the experience together. Perhaps you're right. Anyway. We've got a few years to think about it before we have to make that decision. <laughs> True. We have to pass our final exams first. And if we pass, we'll then have to apply for university. And get accepted. OK, I'll give you eight statements and you have to write down the answers. Have you got that? I won't give you the answers until I've read all the statements, so don't ask me for them because I won't tell you. Right, here's the first one. You usually do this job just before you eat a meal. Ready for the second? Here it is. This is the first thing you do after the washing machine stops. Right, now for number three. You have to do this so something can live. OK, number four. You do this before a birthday party or when you're making something sweet. All right, still with me? Here's number five. You will have to do this if you drop and break something. 
Next, number six. You do this job when something is full. Then you must take the bag outside. Okay, only two more. Number seven. This can be a dirty job because lots of food has been in here, and because it's hot, the food sticks to the sides. And finally, the last one. Number eight. This is the first job you have to do after eating a meal. Okay. Do you want me to repeat any of those? Right. Here are the answers. The first one is lay the table. Lay the table. You always do that before eating a meal. Number two is empty the washing machine. That's empty the washing machine. Definitely the first thing you do after the machine stops. Number three is water the plants. By watering the plants, you help them to live. Four is decorate a cake. You can't decorate a cake until you've baked it. Five is. Sweep the floor. Something you have to do after breaking something. Number six is take out the rubbish. And obviously you have to go outside to take the rubbish out. Seven is clean the cooker. You cook lots of food on or in the cooker, and it gets dirty, so you have to clean it. Finally, number eight is clear the table. We started with lay the table, and we finish with. Clear the table. Hi guys, and welcome to our vlog. I'm Yasmin, and this is my brother. Sorry, co-presenter Lewis. Thanks, Yasmin. In today's vlog, we're talking about free time. You know, that time when you can chill, play games. Or just watch films and enjoy your favourite food. <laughs> But recently, we swapped TV and video games for a new and exciting form of entertainment. Why? Just for the fun of it. Introducing, drum roll, please, Lewis. Social deduction puzzles. Social what? These. Why don't you want to take part? Ah, why didn't you say? I love this game, and it's so easy. You get clues about a situation, and you have to guess what happened. Hey, and you can't cheat, so follow the rules, okay? Now, ready? Always. Okay, here we go. A man was walking in his garden one morning when he found a carrot, five pieces of coal, and a hat. Nobody had thrown them into the garden, so how did they get there? 
did his dog find them and leave them in the middle of the garden while he was walking? Nope. He hasn't got a dog. But has he got children? Yes. And was it winter? Yes. So, the day before he found the carrot and things, his children had made a snowman. Then, it got warmer and... Yep, the snowman disappeared. Hey, I thought of the solution, so I wanted to say the answer. Chill, Lewis. I was just finishing the sentence for you. And that was well easy anyway. As you can see, it gets quite competitive. But that's the fun. And now it's your turn. Ready? Here we go. Harry reported that somebody had broken into his house and had stolen his gold watch. But while they were searching the house, they noticed the thieves hadn't damaged anything else. There were no fingerprints and the carpet was surprisingly clean. The next day, they arrested Harry. Why? Have you got the skills to solve the puzzle? Get a teammate if you have to, but don't give up until you have the answer. That's the challenge. Do you accept? Good luck. OK, questions please. Had Harry cleaned his house, you know, the carpet, before the police arrived? No, he hadn't done anything before they came. OK. Did the police find any glass anywhere? Good question. Yes, while the police were walking around the house outside, they found glass in front of the broken window. Interesting. So, let me see. The police didn't find glass inside, they found it outside. So, someone had broken the window from inside the house. You're going in the right direction. So, the thieves broke the window while they were leaving Harry's house. But that doesn't make sense. How did they get in? Oh, I know, I know. The police arrested Harry because he had organised everything. Well done, but why? Maybe he had spent all his money or something like that and he wanted to get insurance money. Insurance money? Yes, you know, if you have a car accident or your house is burgled, you get money to fix your car or replace the missing things. Exactly, that's the answer. The police arrested Harry because he wanted to cheat the insurance company. OK, here's the next situation. Right, a woman was sitting in a cafe drinking a cup of coffee when she looked down into the cup and saw a fly in her drink. Ew. So, she looked around the cafe and called the waiter that had served her a few minutes earlier. She explained the situation and the waiter apologised and went to the kitchen to get a new cup of coffee. The waiter then returned with the cup of coffee and the lady checked it. This time there wasn't a fly in it. However, after she had taken a drink of it, she called the waiter again, this time very angrily. She shouted, 
You've brought me the same cup of coffee. How did she know? Hi, I'm Abigail, and today we're talking about online communities and cybercrime. And to help me, I have Aaron and Helen. Yeah, I run an online gaming community. Um, online gaming communities are a big part of the success of gaming. You know, you go home after school and play with friends. You make new friends, and it's usually a very positive experience. I organise a fashion forum, and like Aaron said, there's something really special about sharing something with somebody who's like you, somebody who enjoys the same things as you. You know. Any online group, forum, shared social media, any of these places are great for meeting people you can connect with.、Um, but there can be some things to look out for. Exactly. Can you explain what those things are? Well, when you start making a friendship. You don't know anything about the other person. In most cases, they're only looking to share their interest with you. But it's when the conversation changes and they start trying to separate you from the group, asking for personal details, information about your family, what you do, things like that. That's when you need to be extremely careful. Yes, exactly. Or they might start asking for money, or saying bad things about you to the whole group, the online community. So, how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, remember you can block people, but if you're in a community, it's difficult. You want to be part of that community, you know. You've made these friends, and you enjoy playing games with them. But really, that's the time you have to speak to someone about it. Yes, if something has happened online that you think is wrong, you can report it. If it's related to school, you should talk to a teacher or your parents. If it isn't, apart from your parents, there are organisations that you can speak to, or even the police. Well, I just want to thank you guys for coming on and talking about this. So we'll say bye and see you next time. Yes, thanks for having us on. See you. Bye. Anyway, nine years later, thirteen-year-old Sean still used to go to the same beach. Had he learned to swim? Yes, he had, but he didn't used to swim so much. He had now become keen on fishing. Cool. Anyway, one day he heard a woman on the beach screaming for help. Her husband had just fallen off his boat. He had just started sailing, and he hadn't got used to moving around in a boat. He was in a lot of danger in the water, so Sean swam out to save him, and he did. The next day, the media reported the story. And Sean was really surprised to discover that the man was married to Alice Manley, the woman who had saved his life nine years earlier. She had been the woman shouting for help on the beach. Wow, that really is a coincidence. First up on this week's Once Upon a Time podcast. We have Jack Barrett, who told his story at the Liverpool Story Night. 
Here's Jack. So it was the end of the summer holidays and I was nearly 13 and about to start year eight at secondary school. I had a new school bag, new school books and a new pair of cool trainers, but I didn't want to get my hair cut. My hair was like a bird's nest and my mum wanted me to spend my pocket money at the barber's. I was determined not to. Then, one day, I went to my friend Mark's house. While we were playing video games, I realised that his older brother Alex was looking at me. Actually, he was looking at my hair and he said, you know, I can cut your hair for free. Well, I was really grateful and said, thank you, that would be great. So, I went into the kitchen with Alex. Now, there wasn't a mirror and I couldn't see what Alex was doing, so when he finished, I went back to play video games. Well, as soon as Mark saw me, he started laughing, so I ran to the bathroom. When I looked in the mirror, I didn't laugh. I just burst into tears. I cried and I cried. Mark's older brother had made a real mess of my hair. It used to be very long, but now it was very short in some places and really long in others. I looked awful. Finally, I went home and I expected my mum to be really annoyed, but she just said, people are going to make fun of you. And she was right. I felt embarrassed and knew my mum had been right. It was the afternoon before starting school and I quickly went to the barber's. Fortunately, he made my hair look normal again. After that painful experience, I decided to listen to my mum and not try any cheap experiments. I'll never forget the day I met my best friend's family for the first time. I was nearly 14 and I was studying in the same class as Maria at the time. Then one day she asked me if I wanted to go to her house for lunch at the weekend. Well, I was delighted that they had invited me. Really pleased. And soon I was at the door to Maria's house looking forward to the lunch. However, when the door opened, I had a big surprise. The house was full of Maria's family, who had all come to celebrate her grandparents 50 years together. As soon as I saw so many people, I started to feel nervous. There were 20 of us around the dining table. Fortunately, I sat next to Maria and she told me all about her family. She also told me to be careful with the water jug and glasses because they were the only presents that her grandparents had from their wedding day. They had lost or broken all the others. Anyway, I soon felt relaxed and I began to enjoy the event. But then a fly started flying around my head it annoyed me and I couldn't make it go away. Finally, I tried to hit it with my hand, but instead of hitting the fly, 
I hate the water jug. Everybody watched as it fell off the table and smashed into hundreds of pieces. Suddenly, there was silence, and everyone was looking at me. At first, I felt embarrassed, but as I remembered what Maria had told me about the water jug. I could feel tears rolling down my face. Next, I could hear laughing. I looked around and saw Maria's grandparents laughing. I didn't know what to think, but they said it was only an old jug, and they were surprised it had survived so long. Well, after that experience, I learned to be more careful when I was at a dining table, and not worry too much about flies. This week on the Once Upon a Time podcast, we're going to dedicate a few minutes to giving you some tips. On how to tell a story to one of our live audiences, we're always looking for new storytellers. So if you've got a story to tell, we're here to help you. First off, you want to connect with the audience, so you want a first line that's going to make them want to hear more. Something simple that they feel they can relate to. You also need to give your story a structure. It's got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And when you're practicing, make notes and write down a few key words and phrases you want to use. But don't try and write the whole story on paper. Audiences also love emotions. So make it a story that is important to you. Expressing your emotions and telling the audience how you felt helps them really feel part of the story, and it will bring it to life. Audiences also love it when the main character changes in some way. You know, when he or she learns something about life. And learns a lesson from their experiences. They also like storytellers who can laugh at themselves. Your story should have some fun moments. Okay, the last thing to say is learn your story so that you don't need to read when you're on stage, and practice, practice, and practice. Until you tell the story naturally. Hey, today's vlog is all about your mates, your buds, your pals, your besties, your squad. You know, your friends. And for Lewis and Yasmin, that's us. And that's why we've decided to take control of their vlog. I'm Isabel, and I'm Max, and we're actually cousins. But today we're talking about friends, what they mean to us, and what makes a good one. Well, for me, that's easy. It's the people who you get on well with. If you meet someone and you like the same things, and have the same sense of humour, you make friends. That's it. End of. End of. Oh, come off it. There's way more to it than that. A real friend is someone who's always there for you, somebody who takes an interest in your life and gives you support when you need it. They're not just there for a good time; they're there all the time. Well, I guess that's true, which means I have three really good friends and one best friend. Let me guess, Lewis. Yeah, I mean. Obviously, we've been friends for ages. 
We met in the first year of primary school and we've been best friends ever since. We're both very similar and we're into a lot of the same things like film and sport. Although he supports the wrong team, which we fight about a lot. But have you ever had any massive arguments? You can say that again. I mean serious arguments. Like, not about football? <laughs> um, no. We haven't really fallen out ever, I don't think, no. Lewis is a great friend. Over the years, he's always been there. I broke my leg a couple of years ago and he came to the hospital every day. I mean, he made fun of me every day too, but his visits really cheered me up. That sounds like a good friend to me. And reminds me of Yasmin. We haven't known each other as long as you and Lewis because we only made friends with each other about three years ago. But she's definitely my best friend. That isn't just because we get on well, although we do have loads in common. It's because she always tells the truth. Actually, some people think she can be too honest, but she's never nasty about it. She's actually really kind, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get you. And I think that shows real respect. It's not always easy to tell the truth. Exactly. But don't get me wrong, she's a great laugh too. But what about you guys? Who are your best friends? How long have you known each other and why are they so important to you? And as always, send us your messages or to Lewis and Yasmin. Bye. Bye. It was 2015 when I first met my best friend Sarah. It's quite a funny story. I was on holiday in Morocco and my luggage had got lost at the airport. When I got to my hostel, I didn't have anything to wear. So, I saw this girl who was about the same size as me and I walked up to her and asked, Hi, I'm Liz. Have you got some clothes I can borrow? She said yes, and that was the start of our friendship. Although, in the beginning, I think she found me quite annoying and we had a few arguments. It was probably because I kept borrowing her clothes, but that was the only time we ever had an argument. We've got on really well ever since. We are both into travelling, so we often go on holiday together. We've visited 20 different countries in the last seven years. Not bad, is it? Although there are still a few places we haven't visited like the USA. Maybe next year. Our last trip was three days in Paris. That was last weekend. It was great fun, but it was really expensive. I'm so happy that we became friends, and I know that she's going to be a friend for life. It's a great feeling. So, let's talk friendship, Ben. Good idea. Have you ever done something to help out a friend of yours, Laura? Oh, I'll need to think about that. I mean, certainly nothing compared to the display of true friendship in the story we're talking about today. Ben, can you tell the listeners a bit more? Yes. Well, it happened in a small town in Victoria, in the south of Australia, and it's a news story about two school friends 
Lisa and Aaron, who have been friends since first grade. Lisa's family is originally from France, but her parents, her sister, and she have been residents in Australia since Lisa was born. For years, Lisa wanted to visit her elderly grandparents in their village back in France, but her family wasn't able to afford the cost of the flight. Aaron took a big interest in his friend's life, and knew how much it would mean for her to see her grandparents. And wanted to do something to help, so he made the decision to buy her the ticket, which is very expensive, especially when you're a regular teenager at high school. Exactly, but in his free time, Aaron did a part-time job at a local shop. Every month. He put the money he earned in a bank, and after six months, he had enough to pay for Lisa's flight. Ah,、oh, what a wonderful story! And when asked about his reason for doing this, he said, "She's always been a really good friend to me, and." I wanted to do her a favor to thank her for all the times she has helped me. When he presented the ticket to Lisa, she couldn't believe that her friend would do something like that. That must have felt good. For sure. What was also interesting was what Aaron's dad said. Helping his friend has made a real difference to Aaron, and it has made him realise what he can do when he puts his mind to it. I think that's a valuable and important lesson for all of us to learn. Everyone benefits from doing a good deed. I've been a teacher for many years, and in that time, the most important lesson I've learned and also taught to my students is to recognise that every student has different skills. They also have different strengths and weaknesses, but every student is important. Once students can understand this, they tend to show their classmates more respect and give support to their friends when they need it. Results from traditional tests will only show one type of skill, which is why I rarely use them in class. Discussions can help students see a different point of view. But my favourite way to get students to recognise their differences is with this whole class activity, which I often do at the start of the year. First, I split the students into four or five groups, then give each group a box with a set of instructions and some paper, card, pens. Glue and scissors inside. I tell each group that the only rule is they must follow the instructions and make a simple card with the materials, and that the group who finishes first is the winner. Simple, yes. Sounds fair. That's what the students think, but only one group. Has the standard instructions. All the other groups have something that makes the task more difficult. For example, one group's instructions are all in Spanish. One group can only use one hand. One group can't speak, and one group must close their eyes. Naturally, the group with the standard instructions finish first, 
and I make a point of asking the rest of the class to cheer them while I tell them how clever they are. Soon, other students start complaining about how the activity wasn't fair, how their group had a disadvantage which made the activity much harder to complete, or how they couldn't understand the instructions. At this point, we stop the activity and I ask students to write down how they felt during the activity and what we can learn from it. We're talking about friendships on today's podcast and the difficulties young people have making new friends. And I'm joined in the studio by Megan Vrana, a friendship expert. Hi, Megan. Hi, Jack. First of all, you're right to say it's difficult. A recent study in the USA found that most adults haven't made a new friend for five years. And why is that? Some people have said they are too shy, while many others have found it difficult to break into new social circles. But the good news is, I think it's easier for teenagers as they haven't formed their social circles yet. Good to know. I moved to a new school this year and I've been trying to meet more people. So, what should I do? First of all, have you met any possible friends? Mm, not yet. Look around you at school during class and break times to see what the other students are interested in. You could also start a study group or book club at school. Good idea. What else? Have you joined any after-school clubs or groups? I've been thinking about joining the athletics club. That looks good. Brilliant. You can also look outside school. I've been helping at the local community cinema in my city, and I've met some really cool people there. Have you thought about that? No, I haven't. We haven't been living in the area for long, so I need to find out what is out there. Yes, you must. You've made a positive start, but now is the time to really get out there. Thanks, Megan. In this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the things students and teachers can do to welcome new students. And finally, some of the special events you can organise. First of all, let's talk about the students. It's really important that in the first week, New students aren't left alone outside of class. For example, at lunchtime, we should make sure we sit with them and include them in groups. Turning to the teachers, they should give new students lots of chances to talk about themselves in class so that other students can get to know them. For instance, they could ask them to talk about their hobbies, their old school, and what it's like to be new. Finally, we could organise an after-school meeting in a local cafe so everyone has the chance to make friends away from school. To sum up, teachers and students can do a lot to welcome new students, but we must decide on what to do before the new students arrive. Hi there, it's Adam. I hope you had a good weekend. 
I wanted to tell you all about what I did. I had a great time with my friend Marco and his family. We get on really well, so he invited me over to help him celebrate his birthday. They live in a house near the sea. It's quite small, but I really like it. It's much better than being in an apartment in town. I got there on Friday evening at about six o'clock, and we went out for dinner at seven with his mum and dad and his sister Anna. So there were five of us. We had a fantastic meal at an Italian restaurant. My pizza was amazing, and Marco had pasta. That looked excellent as well. On Saturday morning, we walked into town, then caught a bus to the beach. We were there all day. The sea was really warm, so we were able to go swimming. We took some sandwiches and fruit for lunch, and in the afternoon, we bought ice creams from a cafe in the village. In the evening, it was time for Marco's special birthday celebration, a party at his house. Marco's. Just over a year older than me, I'm still fifteen, but he was seventeen on Saturday. There were about twenty guests, and they all brought special presents. I really liked the T-shirt from his sister. It's got a picture of his favorite band on it. But Marco said that the best present was from me and my brother. Tickets to one of the band's concerts in the summer. Marco wants me to go with him. There should still be tickets available, but the concert's at the very end of June, and on the first of July. I'm going on holiday to Mallorca, so I may not be able to go. I really hope I can. Hi guys, it's us again. We had so much fun last time. We weren't ready to give back control to Yasmin and Lewis, so we're going to be doing some of the vlogs. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. I'm just browsing through news websites because today's vlog is all about fake news and how to spot it. So, we're googling news stories and analysing the information to find out if it's fake or real. How do we do this? We look at three main things. Number one, who posted it? Are they a real journalist or is it fake news? Number two, what are the facts? Do they sound believable or are they far-fetched? And number three, what are other people saying? Do other experts agree with the story? The most important thing here is that you don't just believe what you read; you check it out too. Look at this story, for example. Cotton shopping bags are worse for the environment than plastic ones. So, what do you think, Isabel? Hmm. It might be fake, but I guess it could be true too. Who posted it? Um, my mate Sam tweeted it yesterday. Ah,、uh, it must be fake.、Then. No, no. Wait a second. It came from someone else. A guy he follows called at News Dog blogged about it. I've never heard of them. Okay, what are the facts? It says 
a Danish government department carried out a study and discovered that the process of making a cotton bag is worse for the environment than making a plastic one. Much worse. I reckon that could be right, actually. It's got a ring of truth to it. What are other people saying? Okay, give me a second. Ah, lots of well-known news websites are reporting the same thing. And important update, the Danish government now have an official report on their website. You can even stream a whole news report about it. Okay then, I didn't see that coming, but it must be true. But I guess it's only the process that's worse. Plastic bags must still be worse for the environment. Now, here's a story for you. Regularly smelling the plant rosemary improves your memory by 75%. You know, I've heard something about rosemary being good for your memory, but 75%. That can't be true. Who posted it and what are the facts? I found 12 health websites all with the same statistic. And what are other people saying? I've done some more Googling and found a fact-checking website that contacted the professor responsible for the study. He said that rosemary can improve memory but by 7.5% at the most, not 75%. One website reported the incorrect figure and the rest just copied and pasted it. Some websites deleted the story, but a lot didn't, so that fake statistic is still out there. Proof that you should always check your sources. Now, Here's one for you guys. Tech billionaires recommend parents control children's use of technology. What do you reckon? Real or fake? Get googling and get checking. No way. It can't be true. I mean, the Japanese make lots of microwaves and things like that, don't they? And another thing, they're really useful. I mean, everybody has got one. No, no, it must be a fake news story. Yeah, I'm sure it's fake. Um, let me think. They say microwaves are dangerous, so it could be true. You know, there are quite a lot of people who think we should stop using them. So, uh, yeah, it might be true. But then again, it may be fake news. You can't believe anything you read these days. So, I'm not sure, really. The internet is over 30 years old, and in those years it has grown rapidly. Here's our science reporter, Jade Oney, with a few amazing facts and figures. More and more people are joining the internet every day. But it may surprise you to learn that not everybody is connected yet. In fact, just under 50% of the world's population is online. There are approximately 4 billion internet users worldwide. But where do they live? Well, surprisingly, it is small countries that have the most active internet populations. Almost 100% of the people of Iceland, Luxembourg and Bermuda are connected. On the other hand, 
countries with much bigger populations don't have so many people online. Just over 75% of the population of the USA, about 55% of the population of China, and nearly 35% of the population of India are connected to the net. But more and more people are connecting to the internet in these countries every day. At the bottom of the list are two African countries, Somalia with just under 2% of the population and Eritrea with just over 1% of the population using the internet. But no doubt, more and more Somalians and Eritreans will be online soon. Wow! Look at this video of a guy using the first mobile phone. What? It looks as big as a shoe. It was. It says here that it was 22.86 centimetres long. The longest modern phones are only about 15 centimetres long. Well, I'm sure it wasn't as light as a new phone. It wasn't. It was really heavy. It weighed 1.1 kilograms, a lot heavier than modern phones. Not exactly portable. The heaviest phones today only weigh roughly 225 grams. And look at that charge time. It took about seven or eight hours longer than it takes my phone. And mine takes the longest of any phone to charge. Really? How long does it take to charge your phone? Mm, around two or three hours. And what about the talk time? You certainly had to talk a lot faster than you do now. Look, you only had 20 minutes. Most mobile phones have a talk time of five to seven hours. Yeah. But you couldn't hold a heavy phone like that for seven hours. You'd break your arm. Mobile phones have really got a lot better in just a few years. <laughs> you can say that again. You couldn't connect to the internet, so there were no useful apps to use or websites to visit. You could only make phone calls. <laughs> can you imagine? From PCNY New York, it's This Tech World. I'm Ava Gonzalez. And I'm Sam Cotter. This week, we're looking at androids. The media and the entertainment industries have been telling us for years that we'll soon have androids in our homes. But what is an android exactly? Well, the dictionary definition says it's a machine that looks, acts, and moves like an independent person. They often have human features, display human behavior, and express human emotions. In recent years, androids have become stars of the Internet. Google the words spot Atlas 2.0, Sophia, or Walker, and you'll find some amazing videos of these robots running, climbing stairs, carrying heavy objects, and even having conversations. After watching them, you'll think scientists are getting closer and closer to making androids that really look and behave like us. But are they?
Although the YouTube videos of androids are impressive, there is one thing that they never show a human being. But behind many great androids, there is a human being at a computer terminal, and he or she is controlling the robot through a computer network. So, Why do the companies that make these videos do this? Professor Lisa Strawson from the New York College of Technology explains. It's really a question of marketing. These companies want to create the idea that they have made robots that can think and act independently. But it's simply not true. People talk about fake news in politics, but it also exists in news about science. Computer science is progressing in this area, and at the moment, we can write computer programs that enable robots to do a number of jobs. Jobs that involve repeating the same movements again and again. However, these robots are far more stupid than us, and there is a very good reason why they can't think like humans yet. Which is? Scientists. Still know very little about how the human brain works, and therefore have no idea about how to create an artificial one. So, until science discovers how humans think, super intelligent androids will continue to be fictional characters and the stars of internet videos. <laughs> so, we've got nothing to worry about. Not exactly. Computer software can analyze data considerably faster than us, and robots can also do some things a great deal more accurately. Although the media often talks about a future where androids take control of the planet, it won't happen, or at least not for a very, very long time. Sam Carter created this podcast with the help of Professor Lisa Strawson. I'm Ava Gonzalez. Back next week with more stories from this tech world. Well, this picture shows a group of people, uh, passengers on public transport. I think it looks as if they're on an underground train in a tunnel. Because it's dark outside the window. I also think that it must be an underground train in a big city. There are lots of people on the train, and I think it might be rush hour because it's so busy. It must be spring or perhaps summer. Because nearly everybody is wearing light clothes, they aren't wearing jumpers or coats. Some of the passengers are carrying bags. The carriage is full of people of different ages. On the right, we can see a young girl who might be a student. And there's a woman with a child in a pram in the middle of the picture, as well as older people who could be going to work. The thing that you really notice, though, is that is that everyone is doing the same thing. They're looking at their mobile phone screens. Personally, 
I think mobile phones are great for moments like this. You know, when you're commuting, because you can't really do much else. Anyway, the child in the pram is asleep, so their mum is probably taking advantage of the moment to use her phone. Maybe she's reading the news, watching a video, or chatting to family or friends. Welcome back to the vlog, guys. It's 8am on a Saturday morning. We're on our way to take part in our local park run and I'm super excited for a proper morning workout. How are you feeling, Lewis? You know what, Yasmin? I'm a bit tired because it's 8am on a Saturday morning. Don't worry, Lewis. I was the same when I first took up parkrun. And now I can't get enough of it. It's a free five kilometre running event that started in 2004. Since then, over five million people have signed up in 22 different countries, including the UK, Russia, the USA, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, Malaysia, South Africa and Australia. Now, over 250,000 people across the world join in every Saturday. But why? It's far too early. I already feel tired and I haven't even run yet. People do it for all kinds of reasons. It could just be for fun or for the health benefits. I started last year and it has brought about several big changes in my life. I gave up junk food, I started to exercise regularly and I improved really quickly. That's another thing I'm worried about. I'm pretty unfit. I can't keep up with all those proper athletes. I'll look ridiculous. I know what you're saying, Lewis, but it's not like that at all. There's a really good vibe and it feels like a real community. Everybody warms up together, they encourage each other a lot, and there's no pressure. If you can't carry on, you can just drop out. There's always next week. But maybe I could just drop out now. Oh, come on, Lewis. Hang in there. It's great fun, I promise. Now, see if you can catch up with me on the way. Ha ha, very funny. Yasmin? Yasmin? Bye, guys. Wish me luck. Welcome to your fitness centre induction. I'm Gary, one of your instructors. All of the staff here are professional fitness instructors and all of the equipment that you can see is new. Please follow me to the weights area. Hi, I'm Fee. Nice to meet you. Hi Fee, I'm Carl. Is this your first day? Yeah. What about you? How long have you been coming? Oh, only for a few days. I signed up after some of my friends started working out here. But I don't think many of them will come very often. I know the feeling. It looks like hard work to me. How often are you going to come? I don't know. I'll see how I feel. What about you? I want to come every day. I'm impressed. It's such a great way to get fit. Which classes are you going to sign up for? There are some really good ones. Um, none of them. 
I don't want someone shouting at me for an hour. I get enough of that at school. And I can't see that any of these machines look like fun. What do you even do with that one? I don't know. You'll have to ask Gary. So, why did you join in the first place? For the swimming pool and the spa, of course. Welcome back guys and thanks so much for all your tweets, messages and emails. If you weren't able to listen to last week's show, it's still online, so do go and check it out. On to this week's show and I've got two regular guests with me. Journalist and researcher Sadie Wells and our doctor and health expert Rich Lombard. Today we're talking about the secret to a long and healthy life and in particular the answer to the question Where in the world do the most people live to a hundred? and beyond. Sadie, what can you tell us? There are a few regions in the world where more people than average live to such an old age. These are called the world's blue zones and include the Japanese island of Okinawa, the Greek island Ikaria, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica and villages on the Italian island of Sardinia. So all of the blue zones are by the sea then? Should we all move to an island or at least near the sea and dive right in? <laughs> Well, we realise that most people won't be able to do that. But don't worry, because there are a few simple things that all these people do that help them live longer, and which we can all do too. Obviously, what we eat is so important. And all of these groups of people have traditionally managed to eat a diet high in fresh vegetables, fruit, beans and seeds, with some fish but only a little red meat. A diet like this is likely to protect you from a number of diseases. They also spend a lot of time with their family and friends. But the most important thing that all of these people have in common is exercise. So they train and work out a lot, do they? No, quite the opposite. They're just generally active. They spend most of their days moving, walking, gardening, meeting friends, looking after their animals, farming and hardly any of their time watching TV or sitting at a computer. That's the key. And what I find really interesting is that people in the blue zones live the longest, but they aren't obsessed with their health. Exercise is not something they do on a running track, in a pool or on a basketball court. And it certainly isn't about scoring points or defeating an opponent. It's just a part of normal life and the rhythm of their day. While the rest of us spend huge amounts of money on healthy food, gym memberships and miracle treatments, we still live stressful lives, we're addicted to our phones and suffer from many problems linked to our lifestyle. Exactly. So, what's the best thing we can learn from these people? 
Eat simple, healthy foods. See your friends, and move, move, move. These two photos show young people taking part in different sports. In the first photo, there's a group of teenagers playing a game of volleyball in a sports hall. Whereas in the second photo, there's a girl jogging outside by herself. There are a few similarities between the photos. The main thing that both photos have in common is that they show young people who are keeping fit and exercising. Each photo shows someone who probably leads a healthy lifestyle. However, there are also several differences. For me, the most obvious difference between the photos is that the first photo shows a group of people, while the second shows an individual. Another big difference is the location. Unlike photo A, photo B was taken in much more beautiful surroundings, on a path by a river with many trees. In my opinion, exercising outside is much better for your mental health. But that said. I've never been a big fan of running. It certainly isn't as sociable as playing volleyball either. In my experience, it's a lot more enjoyable to play team sports, and volleyball is a great game to play with friends, and you don't need to be particularly good at it. For that reason. I'd prefer to play volleyball. Here we have two photos of different activities. Both photos are similar in that they show people doing exercise, but one is of a group of boys playing volleyball, maybe at school or at a leisure centre, and the other. Is of a young woman running outside. Interestingly, neither photo A nor photo B shows people using technology, which makes a change because a lot of people listen to music or wear a smartwatch when they exercise. In comparison to photo A. Photo B is much more appealing to me because it's in a beautiful location. Playing volleyball in a sports hall is also a lot more expensive than running outside on your own. As I see it, running is a much better way to keep fit, and the best thing is that you can do it whenever you want because. You don't have to depend on other people. It's a great way to explore new places and enjoy nature too. Most of us today enjoy sport, whether it's taking part to keep fit or just enjoying it as a spectator. But have you ever wondered how and why it first began? The oldest sport is thought to be running, for the simple reason that you don't need any equipment to do it. It's believed that humans first started running about four and a half million years ago. There are ancient pictures of this activity in caves in France, dating from about fifteen thousand years ago. There isn't enough evidence to say when running became what we would call a sport, 
but the first event in the first Olympics was a race on foot, and one of the earliest running competitions on record took place in 1829 in Ireland. Another sport that doesn't require equipment is swimming. Archaeologists have found prehistoric drawings in Libya, which they believe show people swimming, although they can't be absolutely certain that their movements aren't in fact related to something else. Although this is another ancient activity, it wasn't until the 1800s that it became a competitive sport. And it first appeared as a sport for men at the 1896 Olympics in Athens. Gymnastics also have a connection with Greece. Around 2,500 years ago, the Greeks realized they could use it as a way of preparing men to fight. Eventually. It became a popular everyday activity, and it was an ancient Olympic sport. The Romans also used gymnastics to train their soldiers, but later the Olympics stopped taking place, and there was no longer such an interest in it. This changed about two hundred years ago, when two German doctors came up with the idea of exercises for young men that used some of the equipment we're familiar with today. And finally, the earliest form of football is thought to be a ball game from ancient China called Tzu Chu. It was first mentioned as a form of exercise around four and a half thousand years ago. The aim of Tzu Chu was to see who could manage to kick a ball through a hole in a small net. The game was enjoyed by the most important people in China at the time. Although it became less popular there from the 14th century. In fact, our modern version of the game of football has been around for less than two hundred years.